Welcome to the 13th episode of Thursday Table. Today we have with us Ahmad Bey, a culinary expert. Food runs in my blood, says Ahmad Bey, who dropped out of business graduate program to enroll into a school of culinary arts. Born in India and raised in Canada, among a family full of connoisseurs and talented people with culinary skills, Ahmad Beg has been cooking with a difference since the age of 14, assisting his parents in their catering business and was also showcased on channel ABC. Needless to say, he loves to eat and, is, and has a passion for food. His experience ranges from consulting services to restaurants, research and development of fusion cuisine recipes to organizing food events. Widely traveled, he has a unique set of knowledge about the diverse food cultures and cuisines across nations and countries of the world, such as the Turkish, Mediterranean, Italian, Arabic, Mughlai and Chinese, and why they are and what they are. Ahmad Bey currently runs his own food business, catering to events all over North America, with a plethora of clientele, including the Hollywood star, Matt Damon, for whom he had organized a thousand guest party event. In addition to eating and cooking, Ahmad believes in always learning and teaching anyone who has a passion for culinary arts and science. On behalf of all of us at HIE, we welcome you to our webinar and over to you. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, hope you guys are having an amazing day. Um, I feel very honored to be here and um, hope you find this webinar to be beneficial to you. Um, let me start off with a little introduction of myself. Um, well, you did all the introduction. I was born in India um, and uh, lived in Abu, uh, Abu Dhabi for about 10 years before I moved to Canada. Um, talking about you know, growing up as a child, uh, who got introduced to different cuisines at a very young age. Uh, my mother being a very innovative cook in the kitchen. Um, and she, like, her food made me experience like different types of cuisines and how, and that's how I developed the passion for cooking. Uh, my father was a mechanical engineer and he worked for um, Sheikh Zayed uh, at that time when we were living in UAE. Um, and when we moved to Canada, um, it was a it was very difficult for him to get a job in his line. Um, not being able to have the Canadian experience that is required, um, it was a struggle getting a job. Um, but luckily, uh, being a wonderful cook, my mom is. My parents thought, you know what? Let's start cooking as a business. Why not start our own catering company? Um, and then we started uh, from home and received uh, very positive feedback. And, uh, you know, what this business, uh, once we started doing it, um, it, it showed promising potential. And that's how my uh, culinary journey began. I started cooking at a very young age. I was 14. Um, and I still remember the day when I came home, um, I think it was Friday night um, and I came home. I, I said, you know what, today I'm going to cook. I told my mom I want to make biryani today. And she started laughing. And she said, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I want to cook. Um, by the way, you have to understand, I come from a traditional family where guys don't come in the kitchen. Um, and um, the profession of chef uh, Bharachi uh, was looked down upon. Uh, regardless, um, I mean, even if you have, I think if you have the passion for cooking, you should just pursue your career in, in this field. Uh, but I noticed times are changing and people are being more open to the idea of, uh, you know, being a chef or, or a cook or whatnot. Um, and slowly, uh, even outside of India, it's, it's a credible career. Um, so back to the story. Uh, I came, so I came, uh, so, so I, I made my first biryani. Uh, with her guidance and instructions um, and you know it turned out uh, it turned out amazing <laughs> and as years went by I started uh, I started to observe different dishes uh, mastered different recipes started experimenting with different ingredients um, you know asking myself why does it smell this way why what happens if I do this what happens if I add this um, you know and then I think it was in university in my second year, I, I decided I wanted to be a chef. 
And at that time I was enrolled, I was studying business management. Um, and the difficult part was um, I had to convince my parents that I wanted to make a career of being a, a chef. Um, and uh, once, uh, once I uh, convinced them, um, the, everything else was easy. <laughs> um, I dropped out of uh, business college and I enrolled myself uh, into um, culinary arts. And uh, once I was graduated uh, from there, started getting jobs and started working in the restaurants and the hours are like difficult like you're working 80 hours a week and restaurant life is very difficult um i consider myself a foodie i love every aspect of food and how it's one of those things that touches um all five of your senses i mean you can really hear uh, your food being cooked. You can hear the sizzle of what you're cooking and you can visually see at, see, um, like you can see what you're eating, right? right? Like take, a, take your first bite, you feel the different textures, you can smell the aroma. I mean, if you think about it, um, what's more amazing is that these senses are affected um, by the nutrition of your food. Like the more healthy you eat, the better your senses work. So, I mean, it's pretty interesting. Like food affects us physically and, and spiritually. It affects the, in, uh, the exterior and the interior of our body. Um, I feel like everyone should know how to cook. We should know what goes in our body. Um, we should not, we, we should eat, like we should eat not only for the taste, but rather for the benefits it gives us. Like they say, you are what you eat. But if you don't know what you eat, you don't know who you are. <laughs> Um, but let's be honest here. Uh, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And if you're a man, every woman loves a man that can cook. Win-win situation here. <laughs> um, but the only drawback is, I guess, if no one loves to wash dishes, <laughs> but that's a different story. Um, but it's something that you have when you're feeling sad or when you're excited, you know, you celebrate eating, you know, you celebrate by having an elaborate menu or whatnot, it affects our mood before and after. Um, like, I know when I'm cranky, my wife will be like, Pook <laughs> like, uh, like you, you didn't eat anything, eat something like, you know, um, but uh, yeah, so working as a chef, uh, I started off uh, at, um, at my first restaurant, I think it was an Italian restaurant. Um, I was cooking there for a couple of years. Then, you know, I got the opportunity to work different cuisines. I worked at a French restaurant. I worked um, American steakhouses, uh, even being a head chef at a retirement home, which is by far one of the most challenging jobs for a chef. Uh, these retired people are very, very picky eaters. Uh, they want their toast a certain way, their eggs a certain way. The meat has to be a certain temperature. Uh, they're very, very picky. <laughs> Um, I also worked um, in research and development of uh, spice blends for supermarket chains, um, worked at five-star five -star hotels, worked at Four Seasons, by the way, um, had the opportunity to cook for community leaders, uh, celebrities, uh, music, uh, musical um, concerts, sporting events, award functions. I mean... I've been cooking professionally for like 20 years and, and you're constantly uh, learning as I'm, I'm you know, working. Um, and um, understanding and experiencing the evolution of food trends around is like, was constantly happening. It's very important to us. Um, if we talk about uh, global, uh, global food trends, we can observe that eating habits are constantly evolving. The food processing has changed to another level. Um, like as science research progresses, we as a consumer get a large variety of food options. And these options cater to your uh, dietary needs, like whether it's gluten-free or vegan, or if you have a certain food allergy, there's a product for you. Um, I mean, you can have ice cream without dairy. You can have um, cake without sugar. Um, and we're living in a time where you can have a hamburger that looks and tastes like meat, but guess what? There's no meat in it. 
um, as global population uh, keeps increasing, uh, the need for agricultural growth demands more efficient processing. Uh, nowadays, the word food processing has become a very negative term, but I think it's very important for, for, as a, uh, for us as a consumer to understand um, not why it's being processed the way it is, but how it's being processed is more important. But that's a different topic and like on its own, we can definitely discuss it in a more deep analysis. Um, but food evolution is such a deep subject. I mean, I'm just going to skim through a certain topic, but, you know, you can talk about this like on and on because food is always evolving, like as we speak. Um, like, for example, let's talk about uh, barbecue. Um, let's understand this fire without it we wouldn't even have the word cooking as a uh, human being um, discovering fire uh, changed the whole cooking game completely like when a, when a human like when a man started to cook his uh, his game uh, he came to a realization that chewing has become much more easier when the meat is actually being cooked uh, once cooking the game has started the food evolution just begun and people uh, began to live uh, and lead more settled, uh, the, I mean, live and lead a more settled uh, existence, relying on farming and cultivation of crops. Uh, they discovered innovative new ideas. Um, I mean, I, I assume like they would, you know, use a spear now uh, back then where they pierce the animal and we have to figure out how we can elevate it uh, over the fire and um, you know when the the gatherer would gather all, all the wood start the fire the hunter would get the game and you know the curiosity of a human mind gave birth to an idea where instead of flame grilling meats we can actually heat up these stones and rocks and start cooking on it and once that was figured out it started to evolve into pots pans forging metals pottery, clay pottery, utensils, like you name it. Um, the, cu the curiosity of a human mind even gave the birth the idea where um, once the grain is being grinded and pounded and what happens if you add water to it, what happens if you leave it out, um, the food technology was always advancing. Um, like, like back then they would have a horizontal spit where it was suspended over fire and it was the, well, the animal being cooked. Um, that concept has evolved to, uh, to a vertical spit, for example, where much like the ones that used for shawarmas in, in, or doner kebabs in Turkey or the gyros from Greece. Um, and, oh, speaking of Turkey, I was in Turkey recently and uh, I'm re uh, researching for my upcoming book um, talking about kebabs of Silk Road um, and how kebabs evolved um, from its origin and through the Silk Road and invasion of how it spread uh, all across the Silk Road. Um, I was in a city called San Yorfa in Turkey. It is uh, very close to the Syrian border. And not too far away from San Yorfa, there's this place called Gobekli Tepe, right? And it is believed to be uh, one of the first temples made by man. It was discovered in the early 90s. And the temple dates back, I think, 10,000 years or 20,000 years, something like that. Right? And, and I was amazed how advanced they were. Like, they had a whole system set up. And I feel like through worship, like, agriculture was born. And, um, like, if, even if you talk about bread, um, according to history, the earliest bread was made, um, I believe, like 8,000 BC in the Middle East, uh, Egypt. Um, and they would have this tool, which was made of, I think, stones, and they call it the corn. And it was the first known grinding tool. It was used to make bread um, where the wheat was uh, uh, grinded and pounded. Um, uh, and it was blended with water um, and it started to evolve and became an art. Um, and like 2000 years ago in Egypt, like uh, they had this bread. I mean, they still make it till today, I heard, uh, but they call it the Shamsi bread. And 
Shams in Arabic means uh, sun, right? And the reason why it was called a Shams like, was because the dough was made, uh, it would be left out in the sun to start proofing. The proofing process uh, gets activated. And once the dough has risen through the heat of the sun, they will roll it out and cook it in the clay ovens, right? Which... Uh, now in the modern day, it is still practiced uh, in, in a clay oven called tandoor, commonly used in the Middle East, Central Asia, South Asia. I mean, everyone has their own uh, version. You know, in Italy, they have a uh, stone uh, where they bake their breads on. Um, so now throughout the world, bread is being made. And not only was made for consumption, it also like was used as a status symbol. Um like uh, like med medieval times, the whiter the bread is, the high quality it is. And it was suited for the educated and the rich. And the coarser and dense the bread, um, which is made by rye, oat, or bran, um, it was for the poor. And if you fast forward to today's time, the status symbol doesn't apply the same way. Times have changed. The educated people who earned the status to have the white bread didn't feel like it was the best for its nutritional value. Um, and the Persians, uh, Persians, uh, I think 500 BC, um, they used a, a different uh, mill. It was very similar to the windmill and it was used for milling grains. And the Mexicans, I think, 100 or 200 BC, um, they had their own version of a stone where uh, it, it turns very similar to the chakki that that's used in India to make uh, atta, uh, and but it's very similar to that. And the Mexicans used it to grind corn to make their first um, corn tortillas, right, uh, which are used all the time now uh, to make tacos or or whatnot, right. Um, and it was. And not until the 20th century, where because the growth of population, where they have started to use um, chemicals and preservatives to increase shelf life and produce a much softer bread, a certain fermented bacteria, which in its natural form is sticky, now comes in a dry format, right? Um, the active dry yeast, uh, but nothing like a freshly baked bread, uh, like tandoori naan, you know, um, but breads have evolved, um, evolved to cakes. Cakes open the new world to uh, new world to big desserts, right? Uh, so that's where it all started from, from from a simple thing like bread, you know. Um, and bread is like one of the most common carbohydrates. Um, and speaking of carbs, um, we have to talk about rice for a moment. Um, Every time I type, uh, every time uh, I talk about rice, I feel like eating biryani. <laughs> biryani is so special to me, and um, it's like one of those things that's uh, made on special occasions. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so speaking of rice, um, rice, if you in comparison with wheat, has a longer shelf life, and uh, every rice has its own fragrance, and it's unique to its kind. Like there's variations of rice, like all around the world. Um, we have like rice in different sizes. We have the shorter grain, the medium grain, the long grain. Um, we have rice like uh, bas uh, uh, basmati, calrose, jasmine. Um, and the quality of rice is determined, like the less broken the grain is, the higher, um, the, I mean, it's considered a higher quality because uh, broken rice is not desired as much uh, because they tend to stick. Um, but in the Japanese cuisine, um, unless you're making, like, I mean, they're making sushi and you need that sticky uh, rice, right? You need that starch content. Um, that's why jasmine rice is a uh, stickier rice and it's a short grain rice. Um, but because of, you know, because, you know, cooking rice is, is an art, you know, and because of that, um, it requires a, a skill to cook rice perfectly. And it gave birth to a product called parboiled rice, um, which is like introduced because of this. Uh, now you can make rice without having a risk of breaking it while cooking. Uh, but it loses the process of parboiling is that the rice is actually steamed and then it's dried uh, a certain way. But I feel like it loses that natural rice aroma. 
Um, I mean, cooking rice is an art, <laughs> but just for the convenience of the consumer, they came up with this product of parboiled rice. Uh, also in, in like the Basmati version of it is called Sela rice, um, which is commonly used, uh, more commonly used in uh, like the Middle East, like Iran and even Afghanistan. I, I hear it's being very common now. Um, but uh, a secret to to a perfect biryani is the is uh, you know balance of spices. Uh, but you know, speaking about rice, rice rice has evolved where you can get like now you can get cooked rice, which is shelf stable. Um, even rice pudding um, and the starch for rice was used as a thickening agent. Um, you can even uh, process it in a certain way that you get a flour out of it and you can add it to your frying to, to achieve a more crispier texture. Um, you can use rice to make rice noodles uh, and you know they have rice noodles, they have a vermicelli format uh, that's used in Italy, that's used in Thailand, um, you know. And yeah, so, so I mean, they have these different types of uh, rices and um, yeah, so like I was saying, uh, secret to perfect biryani is balance of spices. The rice has to be cooked to perfection, and the meat has to be tender and succulent. You know, and thanks to the the Silk Road, if it wasn't for the trading and different goods uh, of spices and uh, and you know exchange of different cuisines, uh, cuisines wouldn't have evolved like the way they do now. You know, spices play a very important uh, part of. Uh, play a very important role in this matter. Um, spices are a very important a part of flavor. Food for the most part now is being eaten for survival. Not only is being eaten for survival, but we're living in a totally different reality where flavor and presentation is what matters, you know? Uh, I see at the restaurant, customers would be coming to the restaurant and once they get their order, they would be taking pictures of their plate first before jumping in and eating it. Um, but spices, in my opinion, evolved the most out of everything. Not only it is used for flavoring, but we have medicinal value to it. We have stems and barks which uh, give us uh, cinnamon. We have roots that give us turmeric and um, ginger. Uh, we have uh, the fruits, uh, which give us uh, peppercorns uh, and like berries. Uh, we have seeds that give us that, that give us coriander, cumin, um, cardamom. We have flowers that give us, uh, you know, cloves, uh, rosebuds. I mean, we have uh, spices that's used as medicinal benefit. And each spice has its own benefit, you know, and it has its own unique humoral property, uh, which uh, benefits you in a certain season. I mean, you have to understand, like, it has evolved to a level that, you know, science is still studying some certain things. And certain spices also hold a fragrance value. Like, oils are extracted to make perfume. Um, it's not only for a taste, it's, it, I mean, it was a very valuable uh, in trading. Uh, it was just like money, you can say. Back then, I believe um, it was even traded for gold. Thanks for spice uh, trading, many dishes evolved. Um, every culture, um, taste palette are different for whatever reason. Like if you even look at a dish like pulao, like every region has its own version. The only thing same is the cooking method. That's the only thing common if you think about it. But every, like even you look at the Silk Road, the Spice Road, um, every region in that area that they have their own version of pulao. And it's amazing how much it can elevate your dish, like spices, like it can elevate your tea to another level. Um, when we talk about uh, evolution of spices. We have uh, spice blends. Uh, every region, every country, every, um, you know, they have their own version of spice blends. Like, even let's talk about India. We have garam masala. The Moroccans have um, Ras al Hanout. Uh, Middle East, they call it the Baharat uh, or Hawaij. Uh, Afghans have something called char masala because it consists of like four major spices, like cloves, cardamom. Uh, 
I mean, black cardamom, green cardamom, and black pepper, you know. Uh, and Chinese have their version, uh, which is like the five spice blend. Um, the French have their version called the Provincial. I mean, every culture, everyone has their unique variation. Um, it may have the same spices, but the ratios differ to cater their own palate or desires or, you know, whatever the cultural need is. Um, I mean, spice blends are now readily available for the convenience of, of the consumer uh, in the market. They're sold in an airtight container to preserve the shelf life uh, or what to, you know, um, but it has evolved. Um, it's made for convenience now. It's easier. You have the blend ready to go. Just throw it in. Um, cooking has evolved to such a level where even now, like talk about molecular gastronomy which is a study of which the physical and the chemical uh, transformation occurs during like during the cooking, right? Um, food science has always been there since the earlier times. Um, I have like a really, uh, I have a translation of an old manuscript called uh, Kitab al Tabih, right? Where this is a ninth century cookbook. And, you know, we thought we were ahead of it. Like we, we I mean, these guys, like we're talking about replicating a bone marrow flavor in the ninth century, where the author of the book, his cook uh, talks about a recipe for bone marrow called the mock bone marrow. It's not even bone marrow. It's made with walnuts and egg whites to mimic the taste of bone marrow. I mean, it was, evol it was evolving back then. It's, it's, it's still evolving. Um, um, but molecular gastronomy is growing as science and food technology evolves. Like, for example, um, it's basically understanding why emulsion happens, not how it happens, why certain proteins coagulate at a certain temperature and why it happens, how molecular properties change according to a certain temperature and the study of why it happens. And how can we use the study to efficiently produce a consistency in the product um, and it's pretty much cooking on a molecular level. Um, and how can we present this dish on a more artistic approach? We are now scientifically exploring the social aspects of cooking. Um, like molecular uh, gastronomy is now the highest form of evolution of cooking. Now studying on a molecular level, uh, we're now able to create artificial meat and mimic the taste because of religious belief or the growing uh, need or, uh, I mean, um, like through the study of food science, we're now able to fulfill the need of protein through other sources, not meat, right? Uh, whether it's plant or lentils or whatever, uh, the evolution of food brought cultures together. Um, food unites cultures. Um, cooking is fun. It's rewarding on, on its own way. Um, you know, um, and uh, I mean, I'm just student just like you um, and, you know, constantly learning, uh, being, cook I mean, cooking professionally for 20 years, um, you always come across something every day. There's always something that you learn every day. Um, but again, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, and thank you for giving me uh, this opportunity to talk about this. Um, I'm not much of a speaker, but I hope uh, this was somewhat beneficial uh, to you. Um, yeah, thanks. And if you have any other questions or uh, feel free to ask, uh, more than welcome. I think the students have a few questions for you. Uh, Mr. Moin, can we have the students to ask the questions now? Sure, ma'am. I'll just uh, have the students ready for the questions. Yes, boys, are you all ready for your questions? With your questions?
good evening sir uh, good evening sir this is magamali of 11th standard sir i want to ask you a question sir why do people take dessert after meal um it was uh, uh, one of the practices that's been uh, culturally uh, i mean not every culture is like that but most cultures they would end their 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 meal with something sweet um i know there's their cultures that begin their meal with something sweet um like um if you uh, i mean it's 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 not necessarily the end but it's it's like it's something like your palate needs something sweet after you finish with something savory it's just to balance all uh, taste buds and um just through that practice it has become a, a cultural habit you know um and uh, yeah that's what it is but not every culture um traditionally eats uh, something sweet at the end There's certain cultures they start off with something su uh, sweet um like somalia for example uh, certain villages in somalia like their culture they start off with something sweet whether it's like a banana or 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 something you know but it doesn't have to be at the end but it's been it's i, I guess once you start eating um and you your your palate uh, you're introduced to savory things like uh, bitterness or um uh, salty or sour um it, it needs something sweet at the end you know just to kind of finish it you know so it's become a habit uh, throughout years thank you sir good evening sir myself numan gori from the 11th standard i have a question sir sir uh, uh, can the food change the mood of a person if his mood is bad after eating a food can it change it mood into good mood bad mood to good mood? yeah definitely food changes uh, the mood of a person um i think i think anything that you take uh, internally gives uh, a, a certain change to your mood whether you realize it or not um um but yeah it does change your mood uh, if you're hungry your mood is is different um you feel weak um sometimes overeating can change you become lethargic you become lazy you become sleepy um it all depends on what you're eating and when you're eating uh it makes an impact on your mood um uh sometimes uh, and and what you're eating for example if if you're eating something with a high sugar content you you feel more energetic um uh, that's how it leaves an impact you know sometimes you would uh indulge in something um uh you know sometimes sometimes you eat something that's spoiled and you 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 get sick and that impacts on your mood so yeah anything that you take internally like it affects your mood somehow whether you realize it or not you know hope that answers your your question thank you sir this is mohammad sadim from junior ypc sir sir i have a doubt sir suggest me some dishes we have to taste before the life ends sorry uh, i didn't understand your question sir suggest me some dishes which we have to taste before the life ends oh okay um uh, just suggest you dishes um to to oh life and oh i thought you talked about the live uh, webinar and so oh, okay um uh i, I don't know <laughs> um I, you know the food that we get um i mean i'm talking about here in north america it's very hard to find food that's not being affected by gmos or or preservatives i feel like if you're eating something we should try to get it in the best quality the best freshness without any chemicals you know um uh, see i traveled uh, a lot and i'm just constantly traveling in the next couple of weeks uh, um i try to find dishes that are uh, you know being extinct like if not being practiced cuz uh, and for me those dishes are more important to me cuz we have to preserve uh, you know 
our our, cult our culture uh, dishes. Um, I don't know what to uh, tell you, but um, I don't know. I, I think if you did, if you guys didn't visit Turkey, you should visit Turkey. The food there is amazing, and um, yeah, <laughs> you should try the food there. Thank you, sir. Sir, myself, Padal from Level Standard. I want to know that which country has more delicious and healthy food diet? Um, if you study throughout the, the history, um, uh, every uh, region has, I mean, has originally the, all the food is healthy, uh, but it's hard to say which country um, it's, I can tell you which countries have the most obesity, like like America is one of them, and like certain Middle East countries. But uh, it's hard to say which. It all depends on your uh, individually as an eating habit. It's very hard to say. Um, I mean, I think the low one of the lowest uh, obesity uh, is in I think in France, uh, I believe, or somewhere in Europe. Um, but it's it's all about your food portioning and what you eat. You know. It, that determines uh, what's healthy or not. Um, but it's, it's hard for me to tell you a uh, cuisine that is the most healthiest cuisine. Um, you know, every cuisine has its richer version and like the regular version. The richer version is more uh, like for celebration, you know, and then the regular version is the everyday food, you know, and I guess it all depends on what you're eating. Uh, I guess stay away from fast food if you want to, uh, you know, stay on a healthy lifestyle. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's what. Thank you, sir. This is Ayan Khan. Sir, was it easy for you for your earlier stages of being chef? Um, I think you can only survive as a chef if you have somewhat of a passion in in this industry because it's i i feel like um chefs are underrated i feel like see working as a chef is very difficult you're giving you're putting in so much hours you're not you know it's chef job is you don't get paid that much you know um you're not like it's not like a doctor or engineer um it's it's purely for the passion of it um, the toughest part is that, you know, you don't, you, when you graduate, you don't start as a chef, you know, you work yourself up. Like once you work at your first, rest first restaurant, they would give you, let's say they would give you just to peel onions. They'll tell you, okay, you're just peeling onions. You're peeling potatoes. You're slicing. You're just doing the prep work required. Um, and then once you get good, you, you know, you step up and it takes a long time you know, to get to the level of chef, you know, you, you start off as prep cook, then you become a line cook, and then you become a junior sous chef, then you become a sous chef, then you become a, a head chef, and then you become an executive chef, you know, it takes a long time, and it's, it's tough hours, it's hard work, um, and you're working on a fast paced environment, there's no time to like relax, and not to forget, like you're standing on your feet for a good 10, 11 hours straight, um, but the good thing is that you're busy and the time flies just like that. Um, but it is not an easy job. And if you don't enjoy cooking and it's not a job for you, if you wake up every day feeling excited, okay, I have to go cook and you're excited and you know, it's a job for you. Um, I feel like having the skill to cook, um, is knowing how to survive because, you know, no matter how hard recession hits, people are still going to eat. People need to eat, you know, and if you, if you know how to cook, you know how to survive, you know, you can always cook, you can always make money. And uh, yeah, that it is hard, but if you enjoy what you're doing, you know, uh, you will enjoy it. Thank you, sir. This is Aman Khan. I have a question that, as per your experience, what are the rating of Indian food, mostly about South Indian food, as compared to European countries? Um, 
uh, what do you mean by reading? Yeah. What do you mean by reading? Like, um, I didn't understand the question. Tasty, sir. Most tasty. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, got it. Um, you know, I love, I, I love food. I love different cuisines. Um, it's hard for me to say. You know, it's it all depends on the mood. You know, sometimes you feel like you know I have I want to eat biryani, but sometimes you feel like eating idli dosa. You know, it all depends on your mood. Um, I know things I don't like. I don't like broccoli. Um, <laughs> that's one of the things I don't like. Uh, you know, it's 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 an acquired taste for me. Um, but uh, um, for me, uh, rating, uh, I mean, saying w which is more tasty. It all depends on what I feel like eating. You know, sometimes. Sometimes you know, you know, people have difficulty these days. Uh, you know, um, deciding what to eat, they'll be like, "Let's go eat Chinese or let's go eat pizza." You know, it all depends on your mood. You like both of them. Like one day you prefer pizza over the other. You know, it all depends on what you're feeling. Um, you know, for me, the food has to be cooked properly. It has to. If you're paying for the food, it has to be cooked properly. And, uh, and um, yeah, like if it's not cooked properly, it's not tasty, you know. And as long as the food is cooked properly, it, it should be tasty. That's it. Um, but it's hard for me to say which tastes better because as a foodie, uh, I love to eat different regions, different, you know. I know what I don't like and I know what I like. And it all depends on your mood, what you feel like eating even from the foods that you like. Sometimes you have a difficult time deciding. But yeah, as long as the food is cooked and it's has like, you know, it's cooked according to how it's supposed to be cooked, it will taste good, you know? Thank you, sir. Uh, myself, Numan, I have another question. That is, uh, we, we say the sentence that you have a good taste. What does it really mean? Oh, um, uh, so I think nowadays when you say, I mean, when you say you have good taste, that means uh, their taste was more palatable to your taste, right? Or, or um, you know, I've met some people, they would eat anything and they would say it's tasty. Uh, but I guess uh, when, when people say you have good taste, I think they're referring to uh, their uh, palate being more refined compared uh, to other their um, you know they acknowledge uh, the the way it's the the dishes being presented or or cooked um, I feel like uh, yeah I feel like that's what it means um, so you you always have that one person that eats everything and say it's, it tastes amazing but it may not you know people who have experienced different different uh, places where food is, you know, where they try different foods, uh, they can definitely tell, differentiate it from, you know, what's, what's good and what's not. Uh, but I feel like when they say, you know, you have good taste, they're referring to their judgment based on what they ate. And if they're able to pass that judgment, uh, based on critical, uh, you know, analysis of what the food is and it uh, is palatable to the other person's taste, then that's what they mean uh, by, you know, you have good taste. Thank you, sir. Sir, myself, yeah. Asad, sir, I am from 11th standard. What improves a rating of a dish? Um, so can you repeat that question? What improves a rating of a dish? Um, I guess there's many factors uh, from taste to presentation and the use of ingredients. Um, uh, you have to focus on freshly uh, used in ingredients to elevate your dish. Um, seasonal ingredients, avoiding anything that's processed or anything that's canned to make your dish. If everything is made, it's a natural way. Um, it elevates your dish and it gives you a better rating. Um, and you know, you can really tell the mood of the cook just by looking at the dish. 
you know um, you know cooking is uh, you know cooking is used in a fast paced environment but to achieve a good meal to achieve um, you need patience and you can't just be like cooking and checking every second like when it will you know it'll be done when it's done you have to give you have to do your part on being patient and it you know they say the 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 fruit of patience is always sweet you know and uh, it is actually and you can you know if you're cooking in a very bad mood it shows on your plate it shows on the dish i guess it's very important to to cook enjoy cooking and you know you'll achieve um you will achieve a dish which is more elevated than any other dishes and you know the use of the ingredients definitely plays a big role in it thank you sir i have a, i said i have a, another question so you you came across the world so have you ever found a competitor who cooks better than you <laughs> i think there's so many people that cook better than me i feel like i'm still learning um but uh that's the best part finding people better who, who cooks better than you so you uh know where you can improve you know what you're missing um i feel like competition is always there there's nobody better than the other there's always somebody better than the other um and that's how it works and i feel like you know one of the advices i want to give everybody is that um don't be afraid to make mistakes uh when you're cooking you know you have to burn something you have to mess it up if you're not going to mess it up you're not going to to learn from it you have to learn from your mistakes uh if you're proud of something and then you come across another dish which is much better than what you achieved um you know you have to be more happy because you know that you can even you can even uh you know Uh, you can even improve to another level like you know you thought that was your best you know but then you realize that something's better than that you know so you you always have a scope of reaching the higher uh, limits you know so um i always come across uh, chefs which are like you know and i always learn from them uh, in fact one of my uh, when i was working as a head chef my executive chef he was one of the best chefs i ever worked with and he cooked for the queen uh, queen elizabeth and he was amazing i i learned so much from him and uh, and uh, i was never uh, you know i i never envied him but i i you know if i come across somebody who does something better than me um i don't want to you know let go of that person i want to learn as much as i can because there's always room for improvement you know um that's why uh, when you you know that's why five star restaurants get rated differently because you know you're always there's always ro uh, room for improvement you know so um i i get happy to meet uh, you know cooks better than me because i uh, that means i can you know i have i always have room for improvement that was a really good question by the way <laughs> thank you sir i have another question that uh, which is the most best food that you have, uh, according to you that is traditional food um i feel like rural, uh, rural villages uh, they make traditional food and they're not uh, compromised uh, in any way um, they you go to any village and you see what they cook they use everything organic um and they stick to their traditional methods and i feel like those you know every country has its own like you know um version of it but i feel like if you you, you should stay away from the the fast food industry because uh, it's not traditional it's and a lot of the things you're eating is not pure right um but you know things that being cooked on a on a more traditional uh, traditionally uh, straight farm to the table um no preservatives everything natural you know the so yeah thank you sir i'm curious to know that what have you inspired that to start up your career with a chef um what inspired me uh was um uh, 
my mother um, eating her cooked foods uh, is what inspired me. Um, I was a foodie before I was a chef, you know, uh, and that was a very important part um, in my life is to enjoy food so I can become a chef, you know. Um, a lot of people are foodies because they love to eat, but there's some people who are foodies because they love to cook. And, you know, cooking brings people together. It, 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 it gives, uh, I mean, it unites people together. Um, it, it, it brings cultures together. Um, and for me, uh, it's not only the eating, it's also the cooking. And it's more, you feel rewarding, you know. I mean, it feels rewarding to, to cook for people. And, you know, so, yeah. So my mother was like my main inspiration uh, to become a chef. Sir, I have a question. Sir, you said that you're, you're inspired by your mother. Now, are you in a situation to cook like your mother or better than that? <laughs> my, my mother says I cook better than her. I say she cooks better than me. Uh, it's like we always go back and forth. Uh, but um, it's hard to say you do something better than somebody by learning from them. It, it doesn't work like that. Uh, everybody uh, has their, you know, um, uh, but I can definitely say is that uh, thanks to my mother, uh, my cooking has evolved. Um, so what I was just open to a certain type of cooking, which has evolved to a different, you know, um, I had many teachers in life um, and my mother being one of the first ones. Um, and I always learn from other chefs and other cooks, but to, to say learning the base of cooking from the mother you never forget that you know and um yeah my mother thinks that i i cook better than her but um i don't uh but you know it's just a matter of opinion i guess so uh, i have a question so when we are at home and feeling bored, we want to make something new. So can you can you tell me a, a short recipe to eat, sir, at home? Um, it all depends. Um, it depends what's in your fridge. You know, it's hard for me to tell you a short recipe. It all depends on what you have in your fridge that you can use to make. Um, um, I know for uh, for um, uh, are are you vegetarian? Sir, non-vegetarian, of course, Indian. Okay, so I'll give you an example. If you have a busy schedule um, and uh, you would like to make something really fast and you want it to be tasty, what, so I always say um, you can do this one thing that would help you for like three, four days easily. Uh, it is you uh, roast the whole chicken, for example. You roast the whole chicken and you'll eat a quarter chicken that day when you roast it. The next day, the other quarter, you would make soup out of it. The other one, you would shred it and make add mayo and make sandwich, add cucumbers and carrots or whatever, and then make sandwich out of it. Um, and then you can make wraps, you can do stir fry. So that one chicken will give you different uh, dishes to, to make um, eventually. And then the bones don't get wasted. What you do is you add celery, carrots, onions to the bones, you add water and you boil it for hours and you get vegetable stock, right? I mean, not vegetable stock, sorry, you get chicken stock. And then you strain that liquid and you use it for soups or even cook rice in it. You know, you can do a lot of things, but to it, it all depends on what you have in your fridge uh, that will give you an idea of what you can make that thing. But I feel like I give you an example of what you can do with one dish. Uh, you can always use it. You know, when you cook something, uh, you're cooking, thinking what you're going to do with the leftovers. Um, that's more important. Uh, that's especially if you don't have time to cook every day. You know, if, you don't, if, you're, if you're living a very busy life, um, that would be one of the advices I would give you. Thank you so much, Ahmed Bey. 
uh, it was a very interesting discussion. More than the talk, I I noticed that the students were very eager to ask you questions and very uh, relevant questions to them. I would sub suppose. So thank you so much. It has been a nice talk, and uh, it was my pleasure. Uh, most welcome. I hope uh, it was somewhat beneficial. Uh, yeah, definitely benefited. It surely seems to be benefiting everybody here. The boys are really happy with the questions they asked and the answers they got. That was also very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.